don't know if black is the uniform for today. Good thing I got the message. And it's good to see all of you. If you have one of this, please put it in your pocket or put it in the silent mode. Thank you very much. And let's start today by taking a time, um, taking quiet time before we sing the first song, Amazing Grace. John 3.16, it said, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And we are here by his grace. sing this first song, Amazing Grace.
thank you so much for your grace. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to take the penalty for our sin. We thank you, Lord, that we all can be healthy today, that we experience you. And help us, Lord, as we come before you today. Cleanse us. Um, forgive us for our sin. Help us to long after you help us to open our heart and open our mind so that you can fill us with your word we give thanks lord for your grace we give thanks for today for the sunshine for the rain for the family of christ that you've given us we pray lord we want to live up our worship today and we want to live up our dress of our surface may the word of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be pleasing to your sight in Jesus name we pray Amen. let's stand up as we sing the next song 10,000 reason and we bless the Lord of our soul
will sing the next song still. It is written in Psalm 46, verse 1 to 3. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth give away and mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its water roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Verse 10, he said, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. before him in prayer let's start by praying for our church um, if you know anyone who are sick who are looking for a job or those facing trial hardship and temptation let's lift them up in prayer Father, we want to pray for our church. Um, we pray for our friends who are struggling right now. We want to lift them up. We are facing uh, sickness, facing cancer, facing the struggle of their life. We pray that you are with them. We pray that you comfort them and strengthen them. May your scripture guide them, Lord, and strengthen them. And help us as a church to be a blessing, to be your hand and feet. Lord, we want to live up also for the church leader, for our pastor, for the new deacon and community, for Sunday school teacher, for our small group leader, that we may we all be faithful, walking with you, 
and following your word, Lord. Um, that we can say no to temptation and say no to um, sin and say yes to you day by day. Lord, we pray for the mission of our church, for missionary and organization that we support, and also for a missionary around the world, Lord. We pray for each one of us, too, that we can be an ambassador in our community, in our workplace, in our school. Um, you use us, Lord. We pray also for the mid war in Middle East. Pray for we want to lift up the family who mourn for the loved one or the hostage that still um, not return to their home. We pray for peace, Lord. And we want to lift up um, for our Christian brothers and sisters who are caught in the middle of this. Um, that you strengthen them and may they can be the light uh, in the middle of very dark place. Um, just want to lift up for the, the, yeah, the need of you, Lord. May you, through this, that people see that they need you. Each one of us need you. Um, and help us to walk with you, Lord. We want to lift up our imperfect prayer in your hand. May you answer it according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Before we listen to the sermon, I'm going to read the scripture reading for today, taken from Matthew 22, verse 36 to 40. Okay, I don't bring my glasses, so you have to help me reading this one together. Yeah? Okay, let's read it together. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. the word of the Lord. Let's sing the next song, um, Shepherd of My Soul, to prepare our heart before we hear this sermon for today. bit bio of him. Um, Pastor Kev Van Terani is an Iranian-born Christ follower. He's the global compassion pastor at Westgate Church in San Jose and the executive director at Compassion Bridges, a ministry training leaders to its students throughout the Northern California and helping low-income and refugee family with food, job resources, financial and spiritual support. Um, Pastor Kevin is married to his wife, Denise, with, and they have three beautiful children. Okay. 
Ayun pala tayo sa Kevin. Just a little higher. Good to be here with all of you today. How many of you guys are excited about church today? Very good, very good. We're going to have a lot of fun. I'm going to share a lot of stories. I hope we'll encourage you and challenge you in your faith. Um, I will share part of my testimony as well, so you get a chance to hear some of my journey of coming to faith um, and my journey around the world that God has allowed me to do, uh, surprisingly for somebody who was born in Iran in a Muslim family, uh, that I would be preaching Jesus all over the world. Funny thing happened to me on the way to church today. Uh, my GPS took me to a bowling alley down the street. Um, and I turned into the bowling alley, and I, and I circled around the building thinking that maybe it's another building in the same building. Nothing. I looked at my address, and, it, and then I looked at the bowling alley, and I said, that's pretty much the right address. So here I am in my suit, and I walk into the bowling alley. And I said, is there by chance an Indonesian church that meets here? And the workers there looked really confused. They're like, um... Indonesian? Uh, no. Uh, and there's all these people bowling. Who knew that like 10 in the morning, the bowling alley is full of people? I never knew that people bowled. Who gets up this early to go bowling? Um, so it was full of bowling people. So they're like, there's a coffee shop around in, in our bowling alley. Maybe they're in the coffee shop. So I walk in the coffee shop and then I'm walking around in a circle looking. I'm like, does the Indonesian church meet in a coffee shop in a bowling alley? I said, that's very creative of them to do so. So I walk in there, and I look around, and I'm like, I don't see any Indonesians here. <laughs> and everyone's looking at me, because I'm in a suit, right? This is a bowling alley, which everyone dresses very like casual, right? So I'm sticking out like a sore thumb. I'm like, this is clearly not the place. So I get back in my car, <laughs> and I look at my GPS again, and I rerouted it, rerouted it, and I went up Gish the wrong way first, and then eventually rerouted me back this way. So who knows? But uh, it was a lot of fun trying to find the Indonesian church. Um, it's great to be here with all of you this beautiful morning. I've heard such great things about you. Uh, one of my dear mentors over the last 15 years, someone you might be familiar with, is Dr. Sam Earp. And uh, he's a good friend of mine, and we meet every two weeks and uh, just get a chance to spend time with God together over a meal, usually breakfast or lunch. And we've been friends for many years. And he's always talked about this wonderful Indonesian church that he visits all the time that he never invited me to. Uh, but... Uh, he says that he loves this church and, uh, and what you guys are doing here. So it's a thrill to be able to finally visit the church that he's been speaking about all of these years. Uh, I will share a little bit more about my journey. I've been to over 38 countries in the world. Uh, I preached Jesus in over 30 of those. Uh, the other ones were vacation, so I can't count those as missionary work. But uh, one of the countries I went to was Indonesia. Uh, about five, six years ago, I got a chance to go uh, to Indonesia, to Salatiga, uh, and uh, landed there and met some of our missionaries who live in that city at that time. And uh, they took me around the country visiting different places. I got a chance to meet uh, our sponsor child. We had a child that we'd been sponsoring for 10 years with my daughter through Compassion International. And she lived on an island further away from Salatiga. And they flew her and her director in, and we got a chance to spend the day uh, together and I uh, got a chance to take her on a boat for the first time. She flew and was on a boat for the first time in her life, right? So imagine being from a small village on a small island of Indonesia and coming to the big city and getting on a boat and getting on a plane. And uh, she was so nervous getting on the boat. I didn't know that. She was like really nervous. And uh, it, this, the, they took us on a lake. They took us around this lake on this little boat and, uh, and people were throwing in the fishing nets, you know? They would throw the nets in and grab the fish. I kid you not, this Indonesia is the easiest place to fish. While we're going, the fish jump in the boat. <laughs> I'd never seen that in my life, right? I, like literally, we had two fish in our boat, like this big. I'm like, this is the easiest place to fish. The fish just want to die, you know? They, they just jump in your boat with you. Uh, the coolest thing was I got a chance to go speak at a seminary. Uh, who knew? There's seminaries in Indonesia, right? You always hear uh, Muslims always love talking about Indonesia being the largest Muslim country in the world. But the faith that's growing in Indonesia is so powerful. I went to a seminary. There was over 250, 300 young people learning about Jesus, getting trained to become pastors. I got a chance to spend a day with them. I got a chance to speak to them and encourage them and challenge them. Uh, and it was just warmed my heart. They said, Kevon, there's like thousands of underground churches in homes that are spreading throughout Indonesia. And they never talk about this in the news. They'll never hear about it around the world, but God is doing a great thing here. And this was five years ago. Imagine how much more it's grown in the last five years. So it's a, it's a joy to be able to preach Jesus, whether it's in Indonesia or at an Indonesian church or at my church, wherever God allows me to serve, uh, where, wherever God takes me. 
Um, as you heard, I was born in Iran. Uh, I was born into a mixed family. Uh, uh, I had an atheist communist father who had turned away from God in his 20s. And I had a Muslim mother, and I was taken to mosque by my grandmother. Um, neither of my parents took me to mosque, but most of my rest of my family was uh, Muslim, and I was raised to believe in Islam growing up. And uh, I tried to follow God. I tried to believe in God. I remember some of my earliest memories are of praying in a Muslim uh, uh, mosque in Iran near our house where my grandmother took me to. And in our mosque, you would take your shoes off before you entered the building, and uh, you would uh, sit on Persian carpets, because this is Iran. We have lots of Persian carpets. So you would, I remember the smells, and I was on the women's side. They had a, a wall that divided the men and the women, men went on one side and women on the other side. Because I was only four, you know, three or four, five years old at that time, those times that I went, I sat on the, on the side with the women, and they would pray these prayers. I wanted to know God. I, I really did. I wanted to know Jesus. I, not Jesus. I wanted to know who God was. At that point, obviously, Jesus was not something that parents ever talked to me about. Uh, but my journey began there. Uh, my family was uh, well off. We had a, a strong business. My dad had created in Iran a bleach company. And because of that, we were able to afford a lot of things. We had a very large home in the center of Tehran. Uh, we had cars, we had gardener, we had, uh, I had a nanny, uh, I had a swimming pool. I had a, I mean, just a huge property in, in the center of town. And my dad's company was very successful. So we had all the toys, all the things that anybody could want. We called our house the White House because it was kind of made of white marble, you know? So it's like this gigantic house in the center of town. And uh, all the things that a boy could want, my parents uh, would get for me. And things were going well uh, because of my dad's business and, uh, and, and things. But in 1979, uh, when I was four years old, there was a revolution in my country. Uh, the Iran uh, revolted against the Shah, a secular leader. And as a result of that, Khomeini, Ayatollah Khomeini, came into power in my country in 1979. And things began to change. All of a sudden, overnight, this fairly secular modern country uh, of the Middle East, uh, how women had to start wearing the chador or the burqa or the veil. You guys know the full body veil. Uh, abaya is uh, in other languages. And so my parents weren't particularly religious. Uh, they weren't particularly uh, political, so there was no real fear of what's going on. However, the, the restrictions began to start in 1979, right away. And so when we had to go to public, all of a sudden my mom had to wear a full veil, and she was never used to wearing that. She was raised very free all her life, and she listened to Elvis music and Beatles, and you know they wore teeny bopper skirts, and I mean, she had a very free childhood. Um, and so it was very different, but for me, being a young child, I didn't notice much of that difference too much. And we thought, we'll stay here. And then 1980 hit, and we thought things were bad under the revolution, but then a war began. And Saddam Hussein, the neighboring country of Iraq, began to bomb and uh, attack uh, Iran uh, to overtake the oil fields in the country. And it was a 10-year, uh, almost a 10-year war, eight-year war that uh, killed over a million people in Iran. And so it was a devastating war. And my parents, in the beginning, thought they could stay, but then the bombs began to fall and the rockets began to fall. And I remember air raid sirens going off. I remember uh, one night particularly where my parents, uh, we had a large gathering in our home and uh, the air raid sirens went off and you hear bombs landing in the distance. And, uh, and uh, so my parents were scared. We'd emptied out our swimming pool. I remember, uh, this is at the age of five, I remember uh, standing in the swimming pool cold at night, shivering, probably it was winter time. And there was no water in the pool, but we were all staying in there with blankets. And my dad thought the safest place was to be in a swimming pool because if the bomb fell outside the pool, we're safe. The only place we'd die is if a bomb fell where? In the pool, right? So he's like, okay, it's a small area, maybe it's safer, but we're freezing to death out there. So my aunts are yelling at him saying, we're gonna die of freezing, forget the bombs, you know? <laughs> Can we go in the house? And we had a basement, and so eventually after an hour or two, we, we go into our basement and, and was there. And I think maybe that was the night, I'm not sure when, that my parents decided it was time to leave the country. They realized it wasn't safe anymore. It was time to uh, find a place where we could have freedom and education. Both my parents were highly educated and, and wanted us to have the similar opportunities that they had growing up. Uh, my dad had two bachelor's degrees. My mom had a bachelor's degree in business. My dad had two chemistry degrees um, and was a teacher. And so it was uh, important for them, for us, to have a good education. So they didn't tell us. They said their goodbyes. They sold what they could. They didn't tell us they were selling properties and things. Uh, whatever they could, they could sell, but it was, they had to sell it cheap because during war, you can't sell for very high. Uh, but they got rid of properties and they took us on. They said, pack your backpack with whatever you can. They gave me one little backpack. I put my toys in there. Now I'm thinking we're going on a short vacation because that's what they made it sound like. So they said, yeah, we're going to go to Spain. We're going to go on vacation. 
And so I didn't ever say goodbye to my family or cousins. They did, and they were often crying, but I didn't know why they were crying. Uh, I only found out we were not going back to Iran when we landed in Spain, because they didn't want us, the three kids, to say anything at the airports, especially my older sister and I, uh, who were speaking. My younger sister was very small, and uh, they didn't tell us till we landed. They said, just so you know, we're never going back to Iran, and we've escaped, and we're going to stay in Spain. And we cried because we didn't get a chance to say bye to my cousins. I didn't get a chance to... Uh, you know, see my friends at, at school off. Uh, but that was the safest thing for them to do. So we did. Uh, we lived in Spain for a year. And then after a year, they said, we're going to travel to a new country. I learned English in Spain at the American School of Barcelona. And then we traveled to uh, Spain, uh, from Spain to the U.S. I landed in San Francisco Airport in 1982. So now 41 years I've lived in the U.S. I started second grade in Marin County, uh, just north of San Francisco. And then um, eventually uh, college at UC Davis. And the rest of the story uh, becomes very spiritual. Uh, God met me when I was in high school. And uh, it was my senior year. I was uh, invited to go to, I was going to youth group for a little while. I was invited to go to a New Year's Eve party of 1992. So it was December 31st, 1992. And we were sitting in a living room with a bunch of young people. And we were, uh, you know, having fun. And it was a, just a Christian gathering, food and fellowship. And the pastor, five minutes before the new year, said, everyone close your eyes and we're going to pray. We're going to pray for the new year. We're going to pray that God will answer any question you have in this new year. Any question, any doubt, any fear, any concern, just bring it before God. And I'd taken some of my non-Christian friends there, and I closed my eyes, and I began praying for my non-Christian friends, which is interesting because I wasn't a Christian myself, but I knew Jesus was good for them. Somehow, I hadn't said yes to Jesus myself. And as I'm praying a prayer for my non-Christian friends, as a non-Christian, I was an evangelist before I was even a Christian, apparently, uh, and I hear God's voice say to me, why do you pray for them when you don't know me yourself? It was so loud that I opened my eyes because the pastor said the room had to be quiet. But the pastor was 20 feet away, and his head was bowed. And I thought, that's weird. So I close my eyes again, and I start praying more for my friends, and I hear the same voice. Why do you pray for them when you don't know me yourself? And I open my eyes, and I'm like, wow, God, is that you? You're right. Why do I think you're right for the rest of the world and my friends, but I've never said yes to you? So I did. That was my birthday. Uh, it's very easy to remember, December 31st, 1992, uh, and uh, a little over 30 years ago, uh, 31 years ago, that I said yes to, yes to Jesus. And from there on, my life was dynamically changed. A lot of things happened. I went to college, began to serve him in the church while I was a student at UC Davis, and uh, anywhere I could go, any Bible study, any Christians I can get together with and, and learn from, I would do so, young and old. I became a leader in the church, a volunteer leader my freshman and sophomore years. Then my junior year, I became the high school director, my junior and senior year of college. And then God brought me down. Eventually said, you need to come serve among your people. And God brought me to an Iranian church here in Sunnyvale. Actually, now it's in Sunnyvale. It used to be in San Jose, the Iranian Christian church, a church very similar to this. God brought me down to. From a big church in Davis to, and I was invited to go to other churches and become higher level pastors, getting good pay. But I said, no, God's called me to my people. And so I left in 1997, Davis, and I came down to San Jose, became the youth pastor, the EM pastor. I became the English service, just like this, in our Iranian church. We didn't have one. And uh, there was a lot of kids who were falling away from God when I was, uh, before I had, uh, had showed up. And we began to start services there for young people, for English speakers, for college students, for adults who spoke English. Uh, because like me, they understood the language. Uh, I can speak the language fluently, but my heart language is still English. I've been here too long, you know? And so I understand and I worship better in English than I do in the Farsi or Persian language. And so uh, I did for 10 years, served there, and then eventually God drew me out to start my nonprofit that I still run today, and I'll share about it a little bit later in the service. And now I've been a missions pastor, global pastor for the last 14 years of my church, getting to travel the world, getting a chance to go to Indonesia and Thailand, getting a chance to go to South America a chance to go to Africa, all over Asia, Middle East, God's allowed me to go and preach the good news of Jesus. So it's a pleasure uh, to be with you as well, to now preach in an Indonesian church is, is a joy. I want to start by kind of sharing a uh, picture of this building. Uh, this is during my time in Spain. As I shared with you, we lived in Spain for a year. And one of the large, basically, malls, they call it El Cortengeles, uh, and it's the British or English cut is what that means. And it's a, like a six or seven, eight story, uh, sometimes building all around. They have them all over the country of Spain. And every floor is something different. Like grocery store in the floor, bottom floor, then you have like the women's clothing, then men's clothing, children's clothing, toys, you know, electronics. So every floor, it's just like a different, 
different item that they, items that they sell. And this is our favorite store to go to in, in, in Barcelona, where we lived for that one year. And so my parents would always tell me, you know, when we go to this uh, uh, mall, they'd always say, hey, stay next to us. Don't, don't walk away. Make sure you stay next to us, right? Because at this point, it's always six years old. And so what does a kid do when they say your parents give you directions? You don't follow them very well. So we were in the toy section, and I'm very excited whenever we got to the toy section, right? So as they're walking through, I get distracted, and I quickly go off to find my favorite toys in the mall. And, and lo and behold, after like 10 minutes of playing with my toys, I look up. My parents are gone. And so I start looking frantically in the toy section, all around, all around, running around the uh, store looking. Couldn't find them. I get on the escalator. I go downstairs, women's clothing. Couldn't find them. Go upstairs to the electronics. I couldn't find them. Go to the men's section. Couldn't find them. So half an hour now of looking, and I couldn't find them. Uh, now 45 minutes in, I go back to the toy area, and I began to contemplate my life as a six-year-old. How was I going to take care of myself for the rest of my life? I thought, that's it. I've lost my parents. And now I have to get a job, you know, as a six-year-old. I have to find an apartment to rent. Uh, I have to, you know, figure out how to pay for food. I had to figure out how to make food because I never made food for myself. So I have to learn how to cook. I have to get a job. I'm sitting there and I'm crying, right? Because I'm going, this is, I lost my parents. My parents are gone forever. And that's what a six-year-old thinks when they get lost. And so finally, after about an hour, my parents find me. And they're crying and I'm crying. I thought I'm going to get in trouble. And they say, where were you? I said, I don't know. I just wanted to play with the toys, you know. And they said, we told you to stay with us. I said, I know, but the toys are fun. And I got distracted. And so that was uh, one of the first times I got really, really lost. And really got lost because I didn't listen to my parents, right? My parents gave me directions to do something, and I said, I know better. I'm going to go play. And I got lost. Fast forward to coming to the United States. Now, a year after that, I get to come to the U.S. And I was uh, ju in junior high. I had learned the uh, martial art of Aikido. And so I was getting very... Uh, very high levels of that uh, as, uh, in, t in teaching. And so the teacher said, I need an instructional aid, uh, but you want to be a Sunday school aid, I mean, summer school aid, you have to come for an interview. And so I told my mom, and uh, we only had, I think at that time, we may have only had one car, uh, or even if we had two, I think she couldn't drive me for some reason. I think we, for, we were down to one car for that time. And so my dad was at work, and my mom, uh, I think, um, had to take care of my younger sister and couldn't go with me. So she says, I'm going to send you on the bus to go to your interview. Are you okay with that? I said, sure. Now, I'd never been on the bus by myself. We'd done some public transportation in Spain. Uh, but, you know, here in California, public transportation isn't very good. So, uh, you know, you usually uh, don't take buses. They're, they're not very convenient. They take you a long ways out of the way. But there was a very direct bus from my house that went straight in front of my school. So my mom takes me to the bus station, which is uh, just a few, uh, you know, not too far away from my house, walks me there and stands me and says, Kayvon, you have to follow my directions. I said, what? She says, you need to stand right here and you're going to wait for the number 22 bus. It's going to come this way and you're going to get on that bus and it's going to take you to your school. You're going to get off. Then afterwards, you're going to get on that same bus on the other side of the street and it'll bring you right back. Do you understand that? Yes. What did I tell you? I will stand right here. There'll be a bus, number 22. It'll come this way and it will take me to the school. And then I will get off, I will go to my interview, and then I will get back on the bus and come back here. She says, do you understand that? Yes. Can you repeat it? I repeat it again. Get on the bus, 22, this way, there. Okay, you got it. Simple directions. Very simple directions. So the bus, I'm waiting. Five minutes, ten minutes, you know, like, the buses come like every half hour, 45. It, it takes a long time for buses to show up. It's not like New York City or someplace like that that has good public transportation. 20 minutes go by. 25 minutes go by. No bus. Finally, the bus comes, but my mom was wrong. It's on the other side of the street. <laughs> Number 22 was going that way. I thought, oh, my mom made a mistake, and I quickly ran, and I got in front of the bus, and I jumped on the bus. Now, those of you guys who have ever taken a bus, some of you young people probably haven't. There's a reason my mom told me to stay on that side of the street, because if you get on the bus on the other side of the street, it doesn't take you where you want to go. It takes you to another city. It took me to Mill Valley. And not just to Mill Valley, the end of Mill Valley. And I kept thinking to myself, okay, that's interesting. This is a really interesting way to go to school. It's taking me on the highway, 101. Hmm, I wonder why it's taking the Mill Valley exit. Uh, okay, and it's going to turn around, it's going to turn around. We get to the end of the station, the last stop, and the bus is empty. And the bus driver comes up to me and says, son, this is the last stop. You need to get off. And I'm like, uh, 
But I, didn't, I was too embarrassed to tell him that I, where I was supposed to go. I'm like, okay. So I get off the bus, and I'm like, lost. I'm like, I, have, I don't even have money. I have no money with me, right? I just had my little backpack with some things in it. And so I, uh, I, I was embarrassed. I had to go around. And uh, you know, back then, they had this thing called pay phones. I know you young people all have cell phones, but we actually had to pay money to call people. And so I, I asked people in the street, can I have some money? I need money. <laughs> so I, was, I, for a quarter, I needed a quarter, right, to call home. I, I didn't even have a quarter on me. Finally, someone gave me a quarter. I get on the phone. I call my, luckily, I knew my phone number. That was good. Uh, I call my mom. Mom, she said, what? She says, I, I'm, I'm lost. She says, what? What would you do? I said, you know what you told me about getting on the bus? I said, yeah, the bus came on the other side of the street first. And I got on that bus. Now I'm in Mill Valley. She's like, where? <laughs> I'm at Mill Valley now. So I think she gets my dad to leave work early to come pick her up. And then they come and go to downtown uh, Mill Valley at the end of it and pick me up. And they were so mad. And they were so mad, right, uh, that I was lost. I, I, I missed my interview. Uh, so there we go. I thought I lost the job, too. Luckily, the teacher and instructor knew me, so I was able to get the job later. It just goes to show, sometimes when your parents give you directions, it's good to listen. Uh, and, uh, and if you don't listen, sometimes you end up going... The, the wrong way. And now this kind of leads us to the scripture. These stories relate to what we're going to be speaking about, which is in the book of Jonah, uh, chapter 1 through 3. It says this, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Again, God giving very clear instructions. I want you to get and go towards Nineveh. I want you to go preach the gospel to the Ninevites because they've been wicked for too long. And what does he do? He gets on a boat. And let's look at how far away from Nineveh that he was trying to go. Now Nineveh, if you guys look up on the map now, is called Mosul, Mosul, Iraq. And we were there. So if you look up the city of Mosul, that's basically where Nineveh existed. So he was in Joppa. That's the port, town. He had to go 550 miles by land to make it to Nineveh. What does he do? He gets on a boat to go 2,500 miles away to Spain, southern Spain, right? That's where they believe Tarshish is, one of the places. Basically going 3,000 miles the opposite direction. I mean, he's trying to go as far as possible. It'd be like God asking you to go to New York City to preach the gospel to the New Yorkers who don't know Jesus. And what do you do? You get on a boat and go to Hawaii instead, right? That's about the same equivalent. You're like, why would I go to New York? New York people are bad. I would much rather go to Hawaii where there's sun, there's beaches, and uh, you know, uh, nice sand and, and lots of uh, uh, beautiful uh, trees. That's what Jonah did. Jonah almost missed his bus, like I missed my bus. He was selfish, and his selfishness came because of his hatred for the Ninevites. Now you wonder, why does he hate, why does Jonah hate the Ninevites so much that he's willing to go 3,000 miles in the wrong direction? 3,000 miles, that's quite a distance to go in the wrong direction. Well, as you study in history, the Syrian Empire was in charge. The Ninevites were Assyrian. One of their leaders was Asher Banipal. He was a brutal leader. They would massacre the Jews in large, large numbers in very brutal ways. If you study the history of the Assyrian Empire, especially at that time. So you must read into their lines and realize why he's so mad. These people had conquered the Jews and had occupied their lands for over 700 years, destroying their culture, destroying their, uh, their temples, destroying their people massacring children and women and men as often as they could, anyone who spoke against them. You might equivalent, the equivalent of that would be what the Nazis did in, in Germany uh, to the Jews or ISIS or Taliban, you name it, all the terrorist organizations and how much they seek to destroy other cultures. This is the same pressure. Imagine that the hatred that the Jews must have had in, in Nazi Germany times against Hitler. That's what it was the same feeling. Now imagine God coming to one of the Jews and saying, you need to go. I'm going to open the door for you to go to speak to Hitler. How would they feel? That same darkness, anger, would overwhelm that Jewish person. 
Jonah had a hard time. You know, he missed his bus because of his selfishness and fear. But Jonah had a hard time receiving God's mercy for himself and for the Ninevites. Jonah didn't want the Ninevites to come to the Lord. He was too angry. He was too blinded. When he saw the Ninevites, he saw red. That anger that overtakes us sometimes, that's what it was like for him as well. It gets pretty bad because Jonah, finally, most, most of you guys know the story of Jonah because we hear about the fish story. Uh, Pinocchio is, uh, is a story that came off of the Jonah story. And you, you, a lot of people focus on the fish story, thinking that is, that's, that's the, the point of the story is the big fish and God saving him eventually or, or rescuing him or, or resurrecting him, which is actually the correct word uh, from the mouth of the fish. The fish story is actually not the big deal. The big deal is Jonah's heart. It's about Jonah. It's about us. In fact, eventually when the whale comes and he spits him out, which there, I believe there was a resurrection. You know, I don't necessarily believe he died in the fish's, uh, or lived in the fish's stomach. I think he died and was resurrected, just the same way Jesus was re resurrected. Three days later, three days in the whale's stomach. Three days Jesus was in hell fighting, uh, you know, uh, for uh, us before his resurrection. So you see a resurrected Jonah going finally reluctantly accepting the call to go to the Ninevites. And he goes and he says this five-word prayer in Jonah 3-4, in 40 days, destruction's coming. That's it. He goes to the Ninevites, walks around, and he says, 40 days, destruction's coming. Now, this is either the world's greatest sermon or the world's worst sermon, right? Think about it. God tells him to go and speak to the Ninevites. And he says five words to them. Do you think he wanted them to be saved? No. He didn't explain who God was. He doesn't explain God's love. He doesn't explain Genesis. He doesn't explain uh, God's mercy. He doesn't spend time doing anything except for five words. In 40 days, destruction's coming. God's going to destroy you in 40 days. What does he want? He wants them not to receive God in their lives, in my opinion. Because why would you say such a short thing, right? And he just walks around and says that, hoping that they would not say yes to God. Again, I think it's either the best or the worst sermon. The sad part is, in the story, those, um, those who were on the boat had greater faith than Jonah. It says they cried out to the Lord. When the, the waves started coming and they were trying to figure out what was going on, they cried out to God. Later on in the story, we see that that. The Ninevites, they cried out to God. One by one, the Ninevites began to repent. And Assyria, even the king, gets to the king, repents. One by one, we see a salvation happening. Uh, first among those in the ships, and then we see it in Nineveh. Jonah has a hard time. He's still blinded by his anger, isn't he? He's blinded by his hatred and the destruction that the Assyrians have done to his people. Right now, we see a similar thing, don't we? On a global scale, we see the destructive effects of hatred and unforgiveness. Sudan is in turmoil on the verge of another civil war, north and south. The north being primarily Muslim, south being primarily Christian. Ukraine and Russia, another place that we see for the last two years, the evil of Putin and his regime. Israel, Palestine. More recently in the news, China, Taiwan, possibly going to have a devastating war if it happens. We hope it doesn't. North Korea and pretty much everybody else in the world. The hatred that they have towards one another is destructive, isn't it? That's the hatred that Jonah, the story of Jonah is about. We see it again. You see it in these pictures. You see uh, what the terrorists are doing throughout the Middle East to terrorize not just Christians and not just Jews, even amongst themselves. There was a bombing again recently in Pakistan of a mosque by Muslims. They bomb each other. You see the death and devastation in Ukraine, a tiny little nation who was just minding its own business and all of a sudden it has to go against this superpower and in, in war and they're losing, both sides are losing. Tremendous numbers of lives are being lost. Similar to what happened on 9-11 here as well the hatred that caused those people to fly planes into our buildings because they hated 
who we are as Americans, who this country stands for, the freedoms that we might have. There's a story that really resonated for me when it happened to me about the level of anger and hatred we carry in our lives. I was preaching, I was speaking, uh, sharing my testimony at a church uh, not too far away from here in the Bay Area on a Sunday morning. And after I shared, after the service was over, um, people stood by and they were talking to me and shaking my hands and saying hello. And then a lady waited in the back towards the end. And then she came up and she was weeping. I could tell she's been, she had been crying. And she came up and, and she gave me a hug. And I, I didn't share anything that was too emotional in that sermon or in my, in my talk. So I said, what's wrong? Why are you crying? She says, um, I'm crying because uh, I have to tell you, I, I have had for the last 10 years, over 10 years of my life, I've carried a deep hatred of all Muslim people, of all people from the Middle East, especially Iranians. I'm like, wow, like, that's an introduction. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> but you'll see why. You'll understand why. I said, what, what made you so angry? What, what caused you to be so angry at my people and, and Middle Easterners in general? She says, my husband was on one of the planes, the plane that, that crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania on 9-11. The terrorists took my, my husband's life, the love of my life of over 30 years was taken from me. Immediately in that second, I understood her pain. I felt her pain. Could you imagine losing your mom or your dad losing your brother or sister, losing your husband or wife on that plane, and the hatred and anger you would want to carry against the people who did that against you. I felt it, I felt it, and we cried together. And she said to me, until today I carried this anger. And after you spoke and I saw the work of God in the Middle East and the way you spoke about Iran, I am no longer angry. I've given that to the Lord. I know that was not from God. And I'm willing to give that up. And we cried together. We held each other. Sweet old lady who had lost the most precious thing in her life was willing to give up that anger. That's the story of Jonah. That's why he's so angry. The Assyrians had taken away everything from him, had destroyed their culture, destroyed their people, massacred their children. That's why he didn't want to go to Nineveh. He didn't want to preach. He didn't want them to come to know the Lord. He was angry, very angry. So from this, how should we live? I believe that God has three important biblical loves that we should do. One is love God in our lives. We do that by trusting him. Another is to love our neighbors as ourselves, as the scriptures say. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Another is to love one another. These are three areas that God challenges all of us all the time. How do we defeat this anger? By understanding the three loves. How do we overcome that bitterness of, of, of hatred between cultures? By understanding and embracing these three loves. Loving God, loving our neighbor, loving one another. Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. God says it's not going to be you. It's going to be the Holy Spirit that's going to empower you to share God with your neighbor. It's going, to be, it's going to be God who's going to come in, the Holy Spirit who's going to enter you to be able to give you the power to go into the world and share Jesus. We see in Matthew 22, as we saw earlier, 36 through 34, the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that's the first and greatest commandment. The second is to like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. To love your neighbor as yourself. And also says in Galatians, this is the third one, Galatians 6.10, it says, Therefore, as we have an opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. I believe this. It's fairly easy to love God. That's what initiates our belief that there's a higher power, a higher being. Most of us believe, yes, I will love God. I love God. And then loving our people around us, you know, loving one another, those in the, in the believing body of Christ, as it says right here, those who belong to the family of believers, love them. It's not too hard to love those who are like you. It's not too hard to love those who believe the same things you believe. What's hard is that middle one, isn't it? To love your neighbor as yourself. That's harder, isn't it? What if your neighbor hated you? What if your neighbor was angry at you? What if your neighbor despised you? 
God says to love them? Think about how hard that would be and the place that Jonah was when he had to preach the gospel to the Ninevites. But still, I believe that as a church, we can do this. God wants us to love all three, God, our neighbor, and one another. Victor Frankl says this, a small and inadequate faith is like a small fire. It could be blown out with a small breeze. True faith, by contrast, is like a strong fire. When it is hit by strong winds, it is fanned into an in inextinguishable blaze. If our fire is big enough, the winds come, it doesn't go out. What does it do? It spreads. And it spreads to other places and other peoples. God can do a wonderful thing. I believe this. If we practice uh, the three loves, that God can really transform us in the church. We can't just pick one or two. We've got to choose all three. God says, love your neighbor. God says, love one another. And God says, love me. Do we do that? Do we try to do that? Now, in 2021, this hit my family. Uh, we were watching on TV the uh, destruction uh, of Afghanistan uh, a second time, a third time, really. We see the pull out of the U.S. troops, and we saw, you guys saw just a couple years ago, the people trying to grab onto planes and jump on planes just to escape and get find freedom. These are women, children, moms and dads were handing their babies over the wall, hoping the babies would find uh, freedom. They couldn't get themselves through, but they were handing, and the soldiers were picking up babies and taking them in. Uh, the women, that's how desperate it was getting. It was really bad those last few, uh, those last few weeks uh, in Afghanistan in August of 2021. I was watching this crying with my wife, and it really hit me hard. I'm like, I can't believe being in this situation after 20 years of U.S. being there, now pulling out. Look how, in, in a matter of like three, four weeks, the Taliban retook the country. It was, it was crazy. And uh, you saw the bombing. There was a bomb that went off, and I had some friends who actually were near that blast, uh, who were tr missionaries trying to get out. Um, and uh, one of them was actually uh, almost died. She was shielded by a soldier who died, which is an incredible story. Um, and uh, she survived, uh, but was knocked out for hours. Um, and eventually, we were able to get him out of the country uh, through other means. Uh, but um, that hit me very hard. And I remember, I remember telling my wife and God telling me, Kayvon, uh, you need to serve the Afghans when they come. And I felt this. And I, said, I told my wife, I said, honey, I, I need to do something when they come here. Now, the Afghans and Iranians are neighboring countries. We speak a similar language. I understand them. They understand me. It's about 90%, 95% the same. They have 5% different words, as well as Iranians have 5%. It's a dialect of Farsi, the language Dari. Uh, but it wasn't just because of that. I just felt something that God resonated in me. Now, I'd never worked in my life. I'd met like three, maybe four Afghans in my entire life. Uh, I'd met thousands of Iranians. But I'd, and, and the few Afghans that I'd met with, two of them were, half Christ, were Christians, half Iranian, half Afghan. So, I mean, I really, I'd really known one Afghan, pure Afghan person my whole life. And here God's saying, work among them? Where are they? I don't know. How, how do I work on them? I don't know. But God says, do it. What I didn't realize was, when God told me this, that there had been a history of bad blood between Iranians and Afghans. They had conquered each other, and the Iranian Empire, Persian Empire had conquered them, and uh, there was this uh, little bit of uh, jealousy among the Afghans because Iranians had a larger country and military and technology and all that stuff, and there was, just, there was not a good blood between these Afghans and Iran. I didn't know this, but God's telling me to work among them. How do you do this? I don't know. I get a call one day. Kayvon, we need your help. And I'm like, who is this? They go, hey, are we, uh, there's a family we work with at a base. They landed in San, in San Jose. Their caseworker got sick, has COVID, and they haven't had food for two days. There's a family of eight. I'm like, okay, uh, where are they? They're at this address. Can you take them food? We heard about you through so-and-so who knew about you from so-and-so who knew about you from so-and-so. So like three people removed, they found out about me. I said, okay, I, I, give me their number. I get their number. I tell them, I'm coming. I'm going to bring some food for you. They said, please, we've been hungry for two days. Could you imagine being in America for two days? No one giving you any food. And so I went and shopped like three, $400 worth of groceries from uh, ethnic shops. And I delivered the food. I went there and I saw them. And all of a sudden, this family of eight is there, but not only a family of eight, there's 35 Afghan families in this hotel. Do you know where the hotel is? It's two blocks away from here, off of North First Street, just around the corner from here. And I went there, and I saw one, two, three. They all came up and talked to me. They said, could you bring us food? Can you help us? Can you? And I began to build a relationship with 35 families. Now, each family is average of five, so you do the math. 
We're talking about 200 people in this hotel. For the last two years, God has allowed me and my nonprofit to serve at a hotel just around the corner from here, Afghans. I have built relationships with them. We've helped them get driver's licenses. We've helped them buy cars. We've helped them get food. We've helped them get, have resumes and, and, and uh, build resumes and find jobs. We've taken them to medical appointments. And me and 30 of my friends have been volunteering there. I've gotten many churches to come alongside of me. I've gotten friends. My church has donated. Other churches have donated so we can give them food and supplies and bicycles for the kids and Christmas presents. We just gave Christmas presents and uh, you know, three, four boxes of food and toys for the kids at Christmas time. And we give them a gospel tract that teaches them who Jesus is and how much God loves them. Just something very simple. Now, they often ask me, Kayvon, you're Iranian. You know that Iranians don't work with Afghans, right? They're not friends with us in our country. And I said, doesn't matter to me. I said, I have no problem against you. You've never done anything against me. I'm here to serve you. And they keep saying, why? Why would you come and spend all these weeks with us? Why would you come and help us with these things? Why do you come back every week? I said, God told me. And their eyes get big. They say, God speaks to you? I said, yeah. And I tell them the story about watching what happened on the news. And how God told me I was going to work with them one day. And that it's a blessing for me because I have found you. And their eyes go, because they don't have this relationship of conversation with God. They're in fear of their God. God doesn't speak to them. God only speaks to the, the cleric of their mosque or maybe through their Koran scriptures. But God speaks to us directly, doesn't he? And God spoke to Jonah as well. You see the destruction, and then you see this is the people, this is some of the people I work with. Some of the kids and the families, this is just from around the uh, street from here, a couple of streets away, celebrating and giving them different supplies and backpacks for kids at school, and bikes. What a joy it's been to work among the Afghan people these last two years, a group I didn't think I would. You see, the book of Jonah is a foretelling of God's incredible love and mercy that we'll see in the New Testament, isn't it? Jesus is going to come. He's going to die on the cross. After three days, he too will be resurrected. He's going to show us love even though the world hated him. Even though we reject God, he still has patience and love for us. Not just us, every people, every tribe, tongue, and nation of the world, God wants to show his love to. A couple lessons I want us to learn together from Jonah's life. I believe this, God whispers to us, pray and learn to love your enemies. Because if you pray and love your enemies, eventually they won't be your enemies anymore. They'll be your friends. I have hundreds and hundreds of Afghan friends, hundreds of friends over the last two years. Before that, I had three that I knew. Now, if you look at my phone, you'll see almost more Afghan friends than Iranian friends. It's crazy how many Afghans know me. Loving our enemies is painful and can cost us. It's not easy. It cost Jonah a lot. He was actually angry and bitter at one point when the Ninevites turned to God. He was bitter and angry. He said, God, take my life. <laughs> He was so angry that God turned the Ninevites towards him. Isn't that crazy? It's painful sometimes to minister to those who hate us and may not receive us. God doesn't just walk among us. He walks among our enemies and is praying for them too. Amen? We don't have the corner on God. God is in Afghanistan and God is in Palestine. God is in Jerusalem. God is in Ukraine and God is in Russia. God walks in all those lands and prays for them and loves them and wants them to know him. We should know that. And lastly, which is very simple, God's love and mercy is for all. It's not just for some. It's for all. Just the same way, God's mercy is for those who hate us. God's mercy is for those who despise Christianity. God's mercy is for those who have sought to destroy us and our faith and our beliefs. God says love them. Don't judge them. Share with them bread and food and resources. Love them as I have loved you. Forgive them as I have forgiven you. Spend time with them. Therefore, it says, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. Not just some. Not just those we like. Not just those who look like us. Not those who speak the same language as us. God says, let us do good to all. Especially those who belong to the family of God. So it's a joy to be able to be here. It's a joy to be able to share God's message. But for me, I believe that ultimately, Jonah's story is a story of us.
that we must embrace God's love, share it openly and freely and as often as we can with those around us. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your mercy and grace. Thank you so much for this beautiful story in Jonah that reminds us that we come short of loving our, our neighbors ourselves. often. It's not easy to show love to people who don't love us. But that's what you've called us to, God. That's what you're calling us to right now, to love our neighbor as ourself, to go out to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world. God, to love them as you've loved us, to give them truth, to give them mercy, whether they deserve it or not, to show mercy to them as you've shown mercy to us and continue to do so in our lives. God, we love you, we thank you, and ask that you would carry us in our weakness, in our doubts, in our fears, and in our anger. God, heal and restore us because we carry a lot of pain towards other people. We carry pain towards some of our former friends. We carry pain sometimes towards family members who rejected us or hurt us. Help us, God, to show them love, whether it's through prayer or even verbally to tell them that we love them. One day when you empower us to. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for the message for today. Let's read together our as a scripture reading, uh, our memory verse for today, taken from Galatians 6, verse 10. Let's read it together two times. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of household of faith. Let's say it one more time. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are. Let's prepare our heart for the offering. We will sing the song, uh, Shepherd of My Soul, again. in offering prayer.
continue with our um, announcement. We have a few announcements. We want to welcome if any of you new, first time come to IAC. If you have any question, you can contact us um, regarding any small group or um, ministry. Um, we also have a, a fellowship and, and um, some snack to eat after this, so please come and stay. Um, is this for Pemuda or for ne oh, next Sunday? Next Sunday will be with Reverend Michael Boylan with the title Built to Last with Livingstone. Oh, Pemuda will be. This is very good. We just saw it with, with the kids. Um, movie night, uh, Sound, of Free Sound of Freedom. So come and join the Pemuda, the Youth Fellowship at 7.30 this Friday. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, th we have the link to give from sale to, um, or if you bring the check, you can give it to the door. Um, on the way in, there is uh, the scanner for the church bulletin so we no longer print it um, if you prefer you can just scan it on the way in next starting next week okay that's it anything else nothing yeah um yeah let's close it let's stand up we're gonna sing benediction and then i'll ask pastor Fekan to lead me Amen. As you remain standing, just a reminder that uh, Jonah's story is really a story of us, our rejection of God, not just Jonah's, and what he wants to do in our lives and for his kingdom. It's about our unwillingness sometimes to love our neighbor or even our enemies. Who do you hold hatred towards today? Maybe God is asking you to begin to love them through prayer. Maybe God is asking you to forgive those who've hurt you or have been against you. Maybe God is asking you to share his love with them. Just the same way God asked Jonah to love those who hated the Jews, the Ninevites. Number 6, 24 to 26 says this, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face to you and may he always give you peace. Amen? All right, church, thank you. Thank you.